Central Neural Nets. And this is a multi-part talk, talk given by the Street View and Recapture teams at Google. I guess it's Yaroslav and Sergio. Uh, hello, my name is Yaroslav, and uh, I'm going to talk about using neural nets for sequence labeling. Uh, this is an end-to-end -end approach, and uh, I think it's really much simpler than everything you've seen so far for doing this task. So to motivate, uh, here's an example that we have to deal with. We are given images that you see, and then for each image you have to produce um, the number that it contains. It's a sequence labeling task because you have to read the whole number in the correct order. Uh, so here's some uh, examples of cases you have to deal with. Uh, so uh, yeah, so uh, think how you would deal with uh, first this task with a standard approach. So first, you would have to do some text detection to find where it is, uh, where the text is in the image. So in the fourth example, you see that the number is quite small. Then you normally have to find the baseline. You have to segment the characters. Um, you have to score the characters and do some kind of uh, decoding task. Uh, for each of these stages, there's many different ways of implementing it. And uh, people usually implement their favorite one. So for instance, some people uh, implement Viterbi decoding, but then it's not really a mark of one chain. Uh, sometimes forward backward decoding works better. Uh, and the problem is people don't uh, experiment with this. They just uh, implement their favorite way. And uh, those algorithm choices are hyperparameters and we should really be setting them from data. So instead what we want, we don't want to have those multiple stages, instead what we want is a neural network which accepts a whole image as an input and produces a whole sequence as an output. Uh, the key question here is how do you represent the output? Uh, the simplest thing might be to say uh, you have a soft match with 10,000 outputs and if the number is 243, it's the 243rd output that's activated. Um, however, that's uh, not ideal. Um, and slightly more complicated approach is to have multiple softmax output layers, um, each corresponding to a particular digit. So for instance, uh, in the example you see here, uh, you have a softmax layer which produces one, softmax layer which produces four, uh, and softmax layer which produces three. Uh, additionally, there is another layer which says um, how many digits we have. Uh, and we have uh, up to five digits, so we also have some dummy character which says empty digit on the last two softmax layers. Uh, so the advantage of this is it actually fits nicely with the label data we have. We don't know where the digits are, but uh, we can just take uh, the label data that we have with those patches and the whole house number which is contained in that patch, and basically just use back propagation to train this. Uh, so Ian is going to talk more about details of it. Overall, you can view the model as a simple conditional graphical model, where we have inputs represented by the random variable x, and that's just an image. And then we have a random variable called h, which is a deterministic function of x. H is just the hidden layer features extracted by the convolutional net. And one nice thing about this approach is that because H is a deterministic function of X that we only need to compute once, and then we can use it for all the other outputs, we can afford to make H be fairly complicated and expensive. That's different than if we were using some sort of approach that involved a sliding window or running the net multiple times on different segments. Uh, then finally, the top of the model consists of a few different random variables. There's one random variable called L, which represents the length of the sequence, as your just said. And then we have a set of variables S sub I, indicating the different uh, members of the sequence. So keep in mind that L is the random variable for the length of the current input, and N is the maximum length of the sequence of the model. I'll refer back to that on the next few slides. During training, it's very easy to train this model because everything is observed. We know the true length of the sequence, and we also know the identity of the digits that are present. The only thing that's important to keep track of when training is that if you write down the log likelihood of a sequence, the summation in the term on the right ranges from 1 to L, the length of the current sequence, rather than 1 to N, the maximum sequence length. That means that when you back propagate the error, 
you don't back propagate anything for some softmax variables that are not used in the current input. Uh, so for example, here we have an input of 700. It's only three digits long. So the uh, positions for the fourth and fifth digits don't receive any training on this example. At inference time, there's a little bit of some complexity involved. We want to pick the single most likely sequence rather than um, the most likely sequence length combined with the most likely digit in each position. That means we need to maximize over both the length and the identity at the same time. Sometimes you can choose a single most likely sequence that is shorter than the length predictor would predict on its own. But overall, inference is still linear in the maximum sequence length, so it's quite cheap and efficient. Using this approach, we get 95.6% accuracy on full sequences on the public Street View Rust Numbers data set. And on the per character accuracy level, which is the only thing that people have reported previously, we get 97.8% accuracy. That's a slight improvement over the previous state of the art. For the purpose of making maps, we don't care about uh, getting the highest possible accuracy on the entire data set. What we care about is getting a set of predictions that are at human level quality so that we don't put anything inaccurate into the map. We can use the likelihood value that comes out of the model to throw away transcriptions that we're not confident of. And if we choose our threshold for the likelihood such that we attain the human level accuracy on the predictions we keep, we're able to transcribe 95.6% of the public data set and 91% of, uh, sorry, 89% of the private data set, which is more challenging. There's still some cases where we have relatively deterministic failures. Most of these relate to the ways that we prepare the inputs. For example, if you look at the two example inputs on the right, there's one of them where we have cropped the number too tightly, and we can only see the two and the three of a house number that's actually 239. There's another image where our crop includes other text nearby, and we've transcribed some of that other text. One reason that we were able to succeed with this simple neural net based approach instead of using an HMM is that we made the neural net very deep. You can think of depth as giving the neural net extra stages in which it can accomplish tasks like segmentation or localization of individual digits. In this plot, we show that every time we increase the depth of the model, our performance improved, and our best model was 11 layers deep. You might look at this and think that it's only doing better because the model is getting bigger. So we ran some control experiments where we used different depths of models and increased the number of parameters. As you can see, if the model is too shallow, it will begin to overfit as you increase the number of parameters. Depth is a very good prior that says that the function should be formed by composing many different functions together so that some can do pre-processing steps like segmentation and others can do steps like recognizing the digits after they've been segmented. Uh, that's everything from my part of the presentation. Now Julian will tell you about the business side of this project. Thanks, Ian. So now we know that we can uh, transcribe street number on uh, street view images really well. So, but why do we actually want to do that in the first place? So every time you do a search on Google Maps and you're trying to find uh, either a business or you're trying to go to a friend's house and you don't know where they are. Uh, that's one reason why we want to solve this problem. Because basically, we want to know where the, the house or where the business is in the world. And you would be surprised how many countries don't have this data. So if you want to answer your question, we need to uh, find, uh, we need to uh, locate the address. And one way to do that uh, in a scalable way is to basically take street view located images. And if we are able to uh, extract the street number out of it, uh, using the combination of the two information, then we can geolocate the address. So here uh, we found 42, uh, the street number of the Google building, and then we can answer all your questions if you want to go around. So here is a So here is a result on the, the entire uh, automated extraction of street numbers of street view. This is in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil. And you can see the clusters, which are several views of the same street number uh, in the same color. And you can see we have a good uh, recall of the extraction. And it's obviously scaled to a uh, number of countries that actually work uh, Then we are going to go to Paris. And 
Paris is interesting because the numbers are slightly bigger, so they can be seen from really far away. And that gives us some trouble about intersection of streets, because we can see the street number from the other side of the street, and sometimes two blocks away, and if we don't do a proper clustering, we can cluster street number in the wrong uh, uh, streets, and that's the trouble uh, for the map. This is in uh, uh, South Africa, and the interesting thing here is we never train our model in uh, Country. So we can see here that the borders are generalized properly. So basically, uh, the problem is how do we do, how do, we do worldwide geo-addressing? Uh, that's difficult because the world is really big. And so we get uh, scaling problems and also a generalization problem in terms of uh, computer vision. And so we have to solve several scaling problems. One of the first problems is to do first uh, captures the, the images uh, from Street View, uh, using Street View, and then we also need to process all these images uh, using uh, extensive uh, models. <coughs> Another scaling problem is uh, the labeling. So, uh, if you want to have a model that handles several countries' variations, you need to have uh, some kind of training data uh, out of them, and so you need to build a really large uh, training set. And Recaptcha helped us uh, previously on the autom automating book transcription. And so uh, Recaptcha team is also in the street view team. Yeah. And uh, so we repurposed it to also transcribe street numbers and then uh, build this uh, large uh, data set that we can train on. So one of the questions we start to ask ourselves is because this model can handle really complicated baseline and is really robust to segmentation difficulties, could it actually solve captures? Because captures were designed to uh, make the traditional OCR approach with several uh, stages fail. And so we can see here that the model is really good actually at solving captures. Uh, it, it, we trained it on a, a few million captures, because we already know the answer because we generate them. And we get 99.8% accuracy on the capture transcription, which is much higher than the human accuracy. <laughs> and, uh, so we tested that on 100,000 uh, captures that we separated from the training set. And uh, the one thing to notice, as Ian pointed out earlier, is that uh, inference is quite cheap because we do one uh, forward, uh, we do one convolutional computation, and then we, we use all the cost to the entire sequence for all the eight uh, up to eight characters. And so it takes uh, less than 100 milliseconds per capture on the on the CPU. So here are an example of uh, correctly transcribed uh, tra captures. On the right side, you have a low confidence uh, prediction, so it's kind of the hard cases. And you can see it's still able to transcribe them properly. Then we have bad transcriptions. Uh, so there is only 200 of them out of the 100,000. And uh, you can see that uh, it's still pretty good. Usually it's one or two edit, one or two edit distance away from the ground truth, so it's not huge errors, it's mostly segmentation errors. So now, because we know that uh, uh, machines can also solve captures, we cannot rely anymore on only the signal to uh, separate humans from machines. So actually, even before that, the recapture team started to use other signals. Uh, made, uh, one of the signals is the interaction of the users with the capture, how, how do they solve the capture. And so Recaptcha is has become a risk more of a risk analysis engine and use several uh, signals to be able to uh, classify humans uh, as a solution. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you.
So we started and we had an engine which was optimized for photographic text and we were getting around 60, 165% accuracy. And then we moved to this, we got 91% accuracy. That, that model was... Uh, that was a model was traditional... Uh, so replicated CN conventional nets with... No. Uh, no, what was uh, that? Then? No, it was more... Uh, the character classifier was a conventional neural network. Oh, okay. But the other stages were <coughs> more heuristic. Well, there are, there are two traditional approaches, right? One is you, you pre-segment and you apply the conventional net and then you have some sort of decoding. And then uh, the other traditional approach is you take the entire string, you apply the conventional net uh, you know, on the entire string, but then you still have location because you kind of have like a sliding window. And then you do some sort of decoding on top, but it's, it's more like what you're doing, except there's a little bit of constraints. You know, right. it's, you know, instead of having a single output and then a whole bunch of characters, you kind of have vague localizations. Right. The, the, the demo I have on my website actually works this way. Right, and the point is which one you choose is a hyperparameter, so we should not think about uh, what we do. So this is really more like the, this number two traditional approach of, what we used to call this space displacement neural nets, but they're really conventional nets. Yeah, but uh, I think on this one, I think you're talking about your paper where you where you still kind of get out of the neural net and do uh, some kind of alignment with the data. Right? So you need to do bootstrapping to learn the character classifier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it works. It works faster if you do this, but you don't necessarily have to. Right. So it's a choice. Do you do bootstrapping? Do you do something else that's hyperparameter? And the point is, we don't want to have to choose. Um, what to do. <coughs> well, uh, you mentioned about the relationship between depth and the, the sort of number of computational processes involved in inference. Uh, I think that's really interesting. I was wondering if you thought about how you could study that explicitly. Okay, so Aaron's asking how can I explicitly study the idea that I put out that you can think of each layer as being a different stage of processing. Um, I haven't thought a lot about how to explicitly analyze that, but it seems like visualization techniques would be a good first point that we can start looking at what the individual features in the net actually represent. Yeah. And I, was, I was thinking you could also imagine like a, a series of tasks that each seem to evidently require an extra step of computation in the inference process, and then you could evaluate the different the, the depth, or compare different models of different depth and see how they're relative, compare their relative to one another. Yeah, so to some extent we've kind of seen that in a natural experiment already. If you look at things like ImageNet, where you need to localize the object as well as recognize it, those state-of-the-art methods have more layers than things on, for example, CFAR 10, where you only need to recognize the object because it's already been centered and cropped. But it would be good if we could design tasks that uh, control this a little bit more. Right. Because CFAR 10 also has fewer examples. Yeah. Great. Thank you. If there's no other questions, let's stop. Oh, so uh, I was interested in the case that when your L was 3 and you were training forward, you were completely ignoring the backdrop from S4 and S5. Is there no signal at all there that can somehow catch it? Uh, if you just write down the definition of the probability of the sequence and then derive it, the derivative with respect to those final elements is 0. So there might be another way of parameterizing your model that puts some gradient on them, but the way we chose to parameterize it just doesn't. Yeah, the, the backprop wasn't really a design choice. It just falls out of the way that we wrote down the probability expression. Uh, well, uh, the, the capture, uh, were you testing on the elements that were generated in the same generative process of the training set? Was the testing set generated in the same way as the training set? Yes, yes, yes. So it's not like a... So, so the result is not exactly proper. Well, uh, it's not, uh, the, the, the sequence is not in the test set. Right? So in the, in the training set, we never saw the same sequence as oh, in. It's the same distribution. Yes, but that's why we get much better result uh, yeah, yeah. than a street number where uh, we need to generalize more. Yeah. So it's not yeah. like, a, uh, the, the, the results are kind of uh, expected if you yeah. look at this kind of. Uh, so so it's as proper as the vicarious results, which is great recapture, and also the summary screen. And what, what percentage? 90 percent, I think. Yeah, like, I mean, even, even if uh, the test set is uh, the same kind of as the training set, it's not exactly the same, because first it's a randomized uh, 
distortion, so that you never see exactly the same distortion. And as we said, the uh, sequence was never seen during the training, so it has to do a proper decoding of the sequence. It has to find the, the signal character as uh, localized and that's right. So there's still some some uh, difficulty to solve that. Otherwise, this would have been solved already, right? Yeah, uh, I guess it's just interesting that, uh, well, it would be interesting to have a benchmark that captures well, what we're, we're just showing here is that uh, natural images are harder to solve, so yeah. we should maybe focus on harder forms. All right, let's thank our speakers again.